Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Before Dave gets off the stage entirely, I had the pleasure in November with my family and his family receiving a very prestigious award. So let's give it up for the Maples family for getting the Hall of Fame for Angus. Well done. The role I play is I've brought good looks to the program. You, you saw the brilliant people talk before me. Now I come in and I bring the good looks to you. And I showed you not only am I good looking myself, but look at the family I've been able to create. And I know what some of you are saying. How many people have gone in an airport, studied a guy and a wife walking together, and said, how did he get her? I'm the he. I, uh, that's my family. I have three girls. They go to one graduate at Texas A&M. One graduates this uh, spring at Kansas State. And one is attending Oklahoma State and just headed off with a tour bus, if you will, to go meet judging here this morning. So I'm very proud of my girls. If you're wondering wherever where we are, where I'm from, I want to draw it pretty clearly so you understand my world is a little different than your world. Just last week, our high temperature for three days in a row did not go above minus five. Okay? Now, if you think what you're going to hear is a pretty good salesmanship, let me go back one slide here. See that lovely girl, my bride? I picked her up in South Texas. <laughs> I challenge any of you to take a girl from South Texas and make her smile in Minnesota. Those of you who have heard me before know that I come pretty straight. I don't do a lot of dancing around. I don't try to hide figures. So I'm going to come right up front and tell you, what you're going to hear might cause just a little discomfort. And if it does, it's supposed to. Because uh, there are some things happening in this world that probably ought to cause us to be just a little uncomfortable. Times are changing. And I want to just pick that in a couple of photos just to show you how different the world is today than when some of us were growing up. Picture number one. I asked my daughter, age 22, the Kansas State one, who's about to graduate Kansas State, I said, can you go put a picture for me? I'm going to do this slideshow, and she's the technology person, right? I said, give me a picture of John Wayne that I can show the crowd. What do you think her response was? <laughs> Who's John Wayne? So guys, if you're living in the John Wayne world and you think that we can still be successful in a John Wayne world, understand that almost 30% of all the population doesn't even know who he is. Okay? The world's changing. And I said, for kicks, I said, Abby, if you were going to describe today's world, Put a picture up there for those guys to see. <laughs> Anybody know who that is? Unfortunately, that's Justin Bieber, huh? Guys, what a difference this world is becoming, right? Is today's world the same as it was when we grew up? No, it's not. Who would ever think when I was growing up that we would be debating gender, right? Who would ever have thought that would even be in a discussion item? Who would ever thought the United States of America, the discussion would revolve around whether or not non-citizens should vote for elected officials? Who would ever think that, right? It's a crazy world. Understand that and understand that our job is to position ourselves best to take advantage of the world that's coming. I use this example. That's me and my wife. I'm sure you can see I was a handsome devil at one time. <laughs> I have two pictures of this very picture in my office. Not one, but two. 
One, just every time whenever I get down and I'm doing some NCBA and somebody's chewing my butt, I can still look back and say, yeah, but I done good. <laughs> okay? The other one is, it reminds me of the importance of positioning. Okay? I am there at the ripe age of 22. And at that point in my life, I was already becoming a futuristic thinker. Do you know why? I said, you know what? I saw a trend occurring in the mirror. <laughs> and I said, I better marry young. <laughs> and I begged her to marry me, and she did. And I tell you what, once they're, once they're married, they forget that she got old and ugly. Now, from a seed stock per perspective, that's where I'm actually going to talk about today. Remember when a seed stock producer was easy? All you simply did was find the biggest one, and you were the best seed stock guy, right? That's me during my years growing up. I used to work for the Breed Association. That's a Gelvy bull. That's when I worked there. Uh, gosh, that's where our world was. All you had to do to be the most successful seed stock guy was create the tallest, biggest animal. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that's changed. Our story begins a little differently. Those of you who have never heard about Schiefelbein Farms, I want you to remember this because it's very important. My father was born and raised in Minneapolis, St. Paul, as was my mother. They knew exactly this much about the beef industry. Now, before you say, oh, gosh, how did, how did he ever survive? In the beef industry, sometimes our traditions are our biggest weaknesses. They can be our biggest strengths when used correctly, but when my dad entered the business, guess what? Did he have any preconceived thoughts what the business ought to be or what it should look like? Zero, okay? And this is something that was discussed a little this morning. I want to hone in on it pretty strong because there's a lot of people in our agriculture world, we get caught up in it. How do we make our cattle more efficient? What do we do on the farm to make them more valuable? I want you to read that top line. That's a, a pretty smart guy there who made the quote, okay? Nothing matters if no one wants your product. So you can be as efficient as you want at that farm. If nobody wants the kind of beef you're raising, does it matter? Does it matter you're producing them cheap? Absolutely zilch. Did our industry go through a point in its life? How many people remember the 80s? Were we just worried about our fences, didn't we? We didn't care about the consumer. They'll eat whatever we produce. Is that a very smart philosophy long term? Those of you who grew up in the 80s like me, remember what the prices were like? Remember what consumption did? When somebody gets in front of you and they begin to focus just entirely around you just worrying about your cows, short-term solution. A little more about the family. It's an all-family operation. It's my dad, eight sons now, so one of my brothers passed away. There were nine sons, eight daughter-in-laws, 32 grandchildren, 21 great-grandchildren. Okay? Now, if you don't have a feel for what that is, let me just show you what I work with every day. Okay? That is the working family farm right there, okay? I am the president of that monster, okay? Now, a warning I will tell you. When you are president of Schiefelbein Farms, do you think you can just say, the world is this way and it shall be? Do you think you have to have just a little bit of consensus skills to try and get things done with that many? Absolutely. There's dad and mom in the middle there. I don't know if you see them right there. Dad's the big one, the big old belly there. It's my father, Frank, my grand, my mother, uh, Frosty. They're both 89 years old. Been married 67 years together to each other. And we just celebrated that here not so long ago. And I told my mother, I said, well, Mom, not many people make it 67 years. Congratulations. She said, son, that's not what I'm proud of. She said, I raised 
nine boys. Collectively, remember the one brother passed away, so eight of them have wives. Collectively, together, we're on a 300-year run without a divorce. And by the way, if you're wondering, we are good Catholics. <laughs> Just a little background on Dad's philosophy and how you, we believe. Somebody said something about continuous learning. That was all the fever with my dad. And remember, he's the guy who never went to uh, animal science. He's got a mathematics degree. He sent us all the way across in various schools throughout the land saying, if we could just learn a little new thing here or a little new thing there, every school's telling just a little bit different story. Let's try and get as much scope as we can. And that's where we are. That's kind of the working crew at home where they've gone to school. A little bit about the farm. We've got about 1,200 registered Angus cows. Okay, That's our bull barn pictured there. And you can see the bull barn is divided into seven different pens with 50 bulls in each pen. So we can test sire groups. So we put sire groups in each one of the pens, seven across. We thought when we built that barn, there's no way we were ever going to fill it. That's about 350 bulls there. The barn in front now is full, and we have one other barn that's full as well. So now we have 500 bulls that we're selling across the country. We'll go just a little bit into how we manage those. I, w I couldn't be a seed stock guy if I didn't put that up, right? Big Frank, that's my dad. The key to our family success is that my boys are not ranching the way I used to. I want you to think about that. Think about those of you who want to cling to your old ways. And my dad is saying bluntly, our success is because we aren't doing it that way. Okay? We're going to take a little bit of some examples here. This is my favorite quote, so I just stuck it in there. I don't know how many people have heard Henry Ford's quote there. But he said, if I would have asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So it's a perspective that some things that are going to sound a little outlandish and a little crazy are probably the edges we need to start pushing. We also have a quote that says, in God we trust, everybody else has to show us data. Okay? We are data-driven operation. We have to see it with our own eyes for us to uptake it. This is what I'm going to talk about. Maximizing genetic progress. And I see there's one geneticist in the room, so he's going to hold me accountable probably. He probably doesn't. He usually lets me slide pretty well. But I like to take things in a pretty basic, basic manner. For us, the way you maximize genetic progress is you find outliers, and then you turn the generations over quickly. Pretty simple deal. You want to find the outliers, then turn the generations over quickly. That's how you make the quickest genetic progress. Everybody with me? Find an outlier, turn the generations over quicker. So if you look at our seed stock operation, study that formula, that's what it's going to be about. Technology and making sure every mating is successful. Every mating, that's what separates good seed stock guys from average seed stock. Every mating becomes what you're trying to succeed. There's some things we're doing. We're going to talk about them just in a little bit detail. We AI every animal. We turn over the herd pretty rapidly. Embryo transfer into marginal cows, and we'll talk a little bit of how we do that. This is the formula, guys. Everybody talked about, I think they called, called them curve benders maybe this morning. I call them genetic wonders. You want genetic wonders with cow sense. The big game changer occurred probably about 10 years ago in the beef business. How many people have heard about the DNA explosion? Huge, right? Now, remember we have the 1,200 cows? At weaning time, we will take a DNA sample on 1,200 calves, OK? That's at weaning. So that they're just basically six, 700 pounds right at weaning time. We take that DNA sample, 
And with that DNA, we get 100,000 pieces of information from each animal. 100,000 pieces of information on each animal. What we're able to do with that DNA is what normally would have taken us 10 or 15 years of data collection, we know at weaning time. So a highly proven, your most highly proven 10-year-old cow of 10 years ago, we know more at weaning time than we do that proven cow of the past, okay? We do the DNA on 1,200 cows, or 1,200 calves. What do we find out? What do we find out on the 1,200? Some animals got a better genetic shake than others, right? Did some get a really, really crazy good genetic shake? Did some animals not quite get as good a genetic shake? The key as an animal breeder then from an efficiency standpoint is find the animals of the 1,200 that are as cool as they can be. And in today's world, we talked about maybe birth to weaning spread or birth to yearling spread or birth to weaning spread. In my world, it's not just two traits, okay? When we're looking at those 1,200 animals, I want to find the 10 coolest animals that do 20 different traits simultaneously well, okay? Now, you guys may think that's easy. Is that that easy to do 20 traits well? Let me just tell you a little story. This, this is now dates me now back almost uh, 20 years ago. So we're doing sire summaries. And I said to myself, as a breed association exact, and I said, boy, we got to do multi-trait. we got to do multi-trait. Why aren't people doing multi-trait? So I just went in to the sire summary when I was there. And I guess it would be, be out 15 years ago. And I said, I'm going to find a bull that just does average or better for 15 traits. And I'm going to start telling the world to use them because we need to get multi-trait. So I went into my search and I typed in, all I want is the top half of 15 traits. The best 50%. All you have to be is the best half. How many bulls did I find? Zero. Zero. All we're asking is to be in the top half of 15 traits. Zero. That's why this becomes extremely important. Now, through the DNA deal, I am finding animals that are doing things that I never thought was possible, and we're discovering it at what age? Do you remember? At weaning time. At weaning time, we know with high accuracy that it, these animals are genetically wonders, okay? So that's the first step. We're finding the outliers, okay? Remember, what was the next step in the formula? Anybody remember? Turn it over. So how are we going to turn over these genetic wonders? We stepped in a new technology called in vitro fertilization. People have done it in humans for a long time, right? So what do we do? We take a heifer just as she's beginning to cycle, and she doesn't even have to be cycling. So at that heifer time, when we find out who our cool 10 are, so in our operation, what we actually do is we find the cool 20, we call them, okay? We sort off, remember, on the 1,200 heifers, we just find 20 that do everything as cool as we can think of. Then guess what we do? We get in, we go look at them. This is somebody, some people miss this part. We go and we have the whole family goes in there and looks at them and we say, of the 20 cools, and these are all good genetically animals, we want the 10 best that are not only cool, but their dam was cool from a phenotype standpoint, and they're cool from a phenotype standpoint. Do you remember when I say genetic wonders plus phenotype? So that's how we do it. We go to the 20 cool and say, okay, now it's just, once you're in the cool club, now it's just looks to see which 10 survive. Those 10 heifers we do in vitro fertilization on. Okay? Means you go in, you into those young heifers and you're grabbing oocytes, right? 
And for those of you who don't know what in vitro fertilization is, you take oocytes, not embryos, oocytes, you put them in a petri dish, okay? You grow them and you actually fertilize it in the petri dish. So the, the sperm goes in there as well. So the sperm and the oocytes are developed and the eggs grow right in the petri dish. Everybody with me? We then take those eggs and put them in our bottom 25% of our cows. Uh, that's the key part. Now, think about that. So here we are, a seed stock guy, okay? We're trying to make genetic progress. We're displacing the worst 25% of our cows with the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of our cows genetically. Do you think that boosts your average? Think about it. Think about the genetic improvement you can make, how much more efficient you can be by displacing your bottom 25% with the top one-tenth of 1%. One and we'll do these to basically uh, 200 of our cows, okay? Now, what's the other cool thing about in vitro fertilization? I don't know if you noticed, we also do some Sim Angus. So we have 1,200 registered Angus cows, but we, have, we produce some Sim Angus. We said to ourselves from an efficiency standpoint, what if we produce Sim Angus bulls for the non-additive genetic components, right? Hybrid vigor, because we want our customers to have that. But what if we didn't have to have a single Semitol cow on the place? Could you do it? That's what we did with in vitro fertilization, okay? So now we go into the 1,200 cows, okay? And we're genetically sorting animals that are complementary to Semitol. We're gonna say, of these 1,200 cows, give me the 10 cows that are most ideally suited to be bred to Semitol, okay? And we in vitro fertilize those. Put their oocytes in the dish, and what do we do to the semen before we put the semen into the dish with it? Anybody know? We reverse sort it, so we're only putting male, se male sex semen into the dish, so we're producing all of our hybrid seed stock bulls with never having a Sim Angus cow in the place. Now you're saying, why would you do that? I'm a little nerdy, like I know at least one other person in here. If you can harness the power of the American Angus Association's database and do that in the cow part of it, and then because you want to just find two, and all we do is find two Semitol sires per year, two elite Semitol sires per year, our Sim Angus are good. I mean, doggone good. Pretty fascinating stuff. We actually did it, purchased an embryo center, and we've gone plum crazy with the dairy industry. I'm not going to get into any of that, but the stuff we're doing with dairies would scare the bejeebers out of you, how genetically focused they are and what they're thinking about from the dairy standpoint. Now, do you want to do all this work? As a seed stock guy, you saw how much work we're doing on it, right? We're genetically getting as deep as you can. We're creating the most valuable genetics. Does it do any good if our customers don't get paid for it? All for not, right? So there's, there's two lessons I want you to learn there. First, you have to get paid for what you're doing if you're going to do it. Secondly, there's a lot of programs and discussions that talk about what cow-calf guys ought to do to be successful. I'm going to boil it down to there's one main thing cow-calf guys must do to be successful. You're probably going to think I'm biased when I say it. Pick the right seed stock guy. Think about it. If you're doing all this stuff and you aren't picking the right genetics, does any of it matter? Should we expect commercial cow-calf guys to do what Schieffelbein Farms is doing at the level that we're doing? Can they do it? No, and they shouldn't have to. Their big decision ought to be which, who is doing it right, buy genetics from guys doing it right, okay, and making sure they're helping me get rewarded for doing the right things. 
This is my dad, another quote from my dad. I'm going to quote him a little bit. The number one rule of business is those who write the checks write the rules. Everybody understand that? Okay. That's why we got into a buyback program, right? That's why we said we cannot let the destiny of our genetics go to some order buyer who is arbitrarily putting value onto it. We got to control that destiny. If I'm putting all these dollars into these customers with all these genetics, isn't it wise that the guy investing in that reaps the benefit of those genetics? Because we know the most about them, right? So we put up this uh, slap barn over here. And people thought we were crazy because we did it about 15 years ago. You'll remember slap barns were tried almost 20, 30 years ago. They fell out of favor and they've reemerged, and we were one of the first to reemerge them. And I want you to think about why would we reemerge a slap barn? Why does a slap barn fit our genetics? An animal is based on two things. And I'm being real simple here, but I hope you understand it. The genetics they inherit and the environment they're exposed to, right? That allows them to express what they are. If you put them, if you have the very best genetics, the very best, and you've in create, in, invested incredible dollars to get these genetics exactly where you want, and you have a snowstorm in January and mud in May, did you get to get, get full value out of those genetics? No, the environment took a bunch of it away. That's why when we said we're going to feed cattle, we said we're going to feed cattle where genetics matter. Okay? Guess I'm a little bit out of order here. The other thing we do in Minnesota is, and it's about efficiency, the key to feeding cattle where I come from is if you can feed what most people can't or won't and sell what everybody wants to buy, you're way better off. So if you look at our whole feeding facility, the ingredient list of all of our rations is most things that most people don't even realize are getting fed to cattle. And I got a list of them there for you. So those are the feed ingredients for our slap barn. And you notice corn and soybeans aren't in one of the ingredients, right? Straight corn, straight soybeans aren't the ingredients. Because are, is corn easy to sell? Yep. Is soybeans easy to sell? Yep. So what we do, we raise corn, we bring it to the ethanol plant, and we backhaul the wet product that's hard to sell because it has so much moisture in it. Look at those prices, too. This is during one of the driest seasons we've ever experienced. Look at the cost of per feed ton for us. Look pretty promising. Managing the environment. Minus 25 degrees. There's the barn closed up on a cold winter day. Now I want to show you that same day. That's the outside, minus 25. Let's kind of creep into the inside. See, this, see what's happening there, guys? Those guys, those cattle experience every day as a good day. Right? We try to keep it right at 40 degrees every single day. And that's kind of where cattle do really, really well is at 40 degree temperature. Okay? The other thing I want to show from an efficiency standpoint, see all those blue tags in their ears? They're all hooked to an EID. What do we collect on every one of those animals? Feedlot and carcass data. Okay? Now, we were really good about collecting all the carcass data, summarizing it, giving it back to our customers, and then we ran into a roadblock. The customers, we'd send them the data back. You know what the customer's response to us would be? Is it good? A lot of numbers. Did I do good? And the next question they would ask is, how do we take it to the next level? If this is my report card, how do I make my report card better? Right? Good question. 
And so who said, so we then turn that sit down with those customers and we say, here's where you are. We can see your strengths, your weakness, et cetera. Remember the lines of cattle, the, the sire groups by uh, pen, each 50? We direct them to the sire line that's going to take them to the next level. Okay? Now, there's something you're seeing or may not be seeing in there that's in equally valuable in there. Anybody watch what fertilizer prices have done? Low or high? Super high. Underneath those animals is 5 million gallons of black gold. 5 million gallons of manure is underneath there. Okay? And when we built it, people thought we were crazy because we said, you know, what if this manure is worth something one day? That's what we just said. And again, we weren't the scientists. We didn't do a lot of research like, like you did, Dr. Jones. We just said, what if this manure is worth something one day? Okay? Today, what's underneath the animals, okay? Not the animals, but what's underneath the animals is worth $75 net per head, period. Net. Okay? Anybody gone to Iowa and seen hog barns scattered through the cornfields? You think those guys just say, you know what? Boy, wouldn't it be cool if I was a hog producer? You know, that's a cool dude. Why don't I just be a hog producer? No. Why are they putting the hog producers scattered through there? For the manure. And this liquid manure with cattle is as valuable. Okay? We even have water treatment going through that barn. And think about this. And I'm going to, don't mean to be controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. For those of you who may have had a COVID shot, how did it feel two days after, a day after? Did you feel it? Some, did, some have known, and some took it hard, right? They said, you know what? I feel terrible. This allows us to, after vaccinations to occur, guess what we're able to do? We just turn the aspirins to them, okay? Okay. So we couldn't put aspirin right into the water, okay? So the cattle, right after they've gone through the most traumatic thing, they've gone through, they got roughed up through the head gate, maybe their head hurts a little, now they got some owls from their neck, maybe from being a little bit sore. But to keep those animals healthy, what do we want them to do? Keep eating, right? So we give them the aspirins for three days. As they're recovering, boom, their consumptions. We used to see the consumption go like this. Now it just goes down just a little bit in terms of consumption. Huge addition this year. And that was just a common sense one. I asked everybody in the beef industry, I said, every hog barn has water treatment. Why don't any of the beef barns have water treatment? What do you think the response was? I guess we never thought of that. Make it pay. This is, this is a real closeout, real cattle, real customer cattle. So when these people say, selling them on average, let's go back to the old ways, the John Wayne ways of marketing cattle, I want to show you what the modern day marketing, look at those cattle, that's one set of cattle. Whole pen load was at 30, whatever is it, 37 head in a pot load. $266 per head premium just on the carcass. Okay, in a pen of 37 head, that's $10,000 premiums. Is that worth doing? I'm going to leave you with this. Take home message, create profitable genetics. Don't ever let somebody confine you to thinking without thinking about who's going to buy your product. Okay. Don't let them convince you that if you just raise them cheap enough, that's how you win the game, because that's a losing long-term battle for the industry. The last thing is, if you're doing all the right things, get paid for it. With that, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate being here. I do have one last slide. Every now and then you need a humbling slide, because by now you guys have got to be thinking, God darn, that guy is smart. That is me pictured in the yellow boots. 
How many people have a partner who's in charge of humbling? <laughs> my wife took the, yeah, you got one too. My wife took this photo and she hung it up on the wall and she put this little sign on it and said, warning husband, tractors don't float because I was trying to do a good thing. The girls were going to go ice skate and I said, what if I just took that blade and just went right across that pond? Then they wouldn't have to shovel the snow off and wouldn't it just be a happy day for everybody? until that tractor with less than 100 hours on it. And if you think they're easy to drive out, I suggest you not do it. Thank you all very much. Don, thank you so much for the talk here that will make us all think a little bit in the future, make us think in the, for the future. And once again, we'll take a couple of questions quickly. Got one right over here. Hey, Don. Yes, sir. Um, That's exactly the one guy I didn't want to raise his hand. First of all, I thought that we were as far apart as you could get. Because you married, you were from Minnesota, married a girl from Texas. And also, and, and I'm from Florida, married a girl from Sweden. So I said, well, we're not, not so right there. I also said, I've got hair, Don doesn't. <laughs> so I kind of thought- I appreciate you pointing that out to the okay. whole group. <laughs> but then you called me a nerd, but you at least put yourself in the same classification. So I said, hey, maybe we're here. And then I really realized that when you pointed out that you married above yourself and a very good looking woman, and I did the same. And so, and I have uh, four brothers. Oh, and really? Sisters. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not Catholic, so see, we're- you anyway, would add, you would add nine if you're a Catholic. I guess so. <laughs> My question is, is you talked about that, you know, the, the genetic cool club. Yep. What's it take to get into the genetic cool club for you guys? Yep. And I know that's different for others, but for you guys. For, for us, and again, Daryl will tell you, indexes to me are just starting to get momentum just starting to do, and as you know, while I was at Angus, we revamped a bunch of those indexes, making $C not just a terminal index, but a complete index. So $C is an incredibly important component of it. So we make sure they're in the top 1% for $C, but then we also drive into some specific components because we wanna make sure that sometimes you can get an average number that looks real good, but your component numbers that got you there aren't what you want to see from a base standpoint. We want to make sure the birth is right, so a calving ease of basically double digits or higher. And we actually put a score on, and, and it goes back to my focus, and hopefully you got that, is if you aren't, if you aren't focused on the consumer, long term you lose. We put a marbling score and a ribeye score on at absolute values to make sure that pounds or something doesn't overwhelm that, that would otherwise get you to that same number, but not in the way we want to get there. And the other thing we put, and this is a huge one for us, is uh, if docility isn't in the top 10%, we don't, we don't mess with it because what we're finding out is our customers at this level with what the selection that we can do, nobody wants to mess with a wild one. And so we put a docility factor in saying, I don't care what the with that dollar C index weighted it, we're gonna put an absolute threshold in there to make sure that none slip through the cracks. So that's how we do it. Yes. This may be a personal question. I was able to uh, visit your farm about five or six years ago. All of us are inher worried about inheritance down the road. And since you've got so many family members, you may not wanna talk about this, but how are you set up when the patriarchs die, keeping that family farm in one piece of not letting one brother, nephew, something like that, forcing you to sell it? Oof. That's a long answer question, so I don't know how I'm going to approach that. I'm going to try to keep it super, super brief. But again, my history was I worked for the breed associations for maybe 12 years, I think, or something. So I came back in 2002, 2003. When I came back, I actually am on my third pacemaker, okay? I look like I'm relatively healthy, but I'm on my third pacemaker. I said, for me to come back, Dad, I've got to have to plan for the wife, 
Okay, I have to know exactly. So I forced the issue with my dad. So at the year 2005, we recreated everything in terms of designing how it shall be. And that is probably, if you look at all the successes in my personal life, the biggest success I had is on December 15th, 2005, I brought that whole group into a lawyer's office and they signed papers literally this thick Everybody signed them, everybody smiled, and we had pizza afterwards, okay? But everything is laid out. Everything is exactly laid out. We have uh, every year that goes by, each brother, and I'm, I'm the one who does the finance stuff, each brother gets a sheet that basically says, should you die, this is what you get and your family gets this year. Everybody signs every year, so every year, so there are no surprises because you never know when the death might occur, right? So every single year, and everybody's assets change every little bit every year, but every single year, and again, I'm, you probably figured out I'm pretty good at it. I may sound complicated, but I get pretty simple pretty quick. The quickest way to have fight, fights not occur is to everybody know the rules ahead of time, and they know precisely, should I die, this is what occurs. Now, that required my father not being in charge anymore. And that was hard on Dad. Hard, hard, hard on Dad. Dad said in, in that year, 2005, he said it was if part of him absolutely died. Because he was the person who was absolutely in charge, in control. He was the one who said, we go left two steps and forward one. Okay. And in the snap of the fingers, it went from dad being exclusively in charge to the group being in charge. So all brothers or all family members from each lineage have equal say in what we do. So I may be the CEO, okay, but the group trumps me. You follow me? So if I say we should go left to the right, and they say, I think we should go right and left, the group wins. Now, what we do differently than most, and it, it's due to the fact we have lots of family members and dad's wisdom, every member of the family is a king of some kingdom. Okay? So everybody has their own kingdom they manage. And the way we do it in practical sense, as long as you're managing your kingdom okay, the group doesn't interfere. Okay? If, you're, if your kingdom gets out of whack, guess who jumps in? The group. Everybody with me? So it also has got the American spirit going from competitiveness. Do I want somebody in my kingdom? So I get pretty competitive to make sure they stay out of my kingdom, right? And so that's a, that's a lot, big question boiled down as short as I could into what we do. But the basic thing is everybody knows exactly what they get paid. Everybody has a, a say in their own future, but the group still trumps individuals. Don, we can listen to you. We appreciate it. We can listen to you all afternoon. Just one thing quickly. Mike Bach asked that question, and I believe Mike Bach has attended every one of these conferences. Is that correct, Mike? How many in this room have attended every one of these efficiency conferences? Please raise your hands. Very good. Glad to have you all.